Now we're going to talk about one of the biggest paleontological phyla there are. Uh, if you remember at the beginning of this course, I talked about uh, different groups and how some are important in invertebrate zoology, some are important in paleontology. And brachiopods are the major group that stands out as having far more um, paleontological data, more paleontological species than in the recent. So the few that we have left today, there's about 300 species. They're just a pitiful remnant of this once very, very dominant group. In Geology 204, I always say that for the Paleozoic, they were the seashells by the seashore. They littered the, um, the ocean bottoms from the crashing waves of the intertidal zone to the deep, deep uh, oceans everywhere. And so their fossils are everywhere as well. So a couple major groups, first of all. Uh, when I learned this, and until recently, say the last 10 years, these things were divided into two major classes, the class inarticulata and the class articulata. Uh, as you see here, I've stricken out the word class or inarticulata. These are now considered the, in, the subphylum linguliformia and craniaformia. A bunch of their rat various uh, features over here. Uh, they are all of these things that most brachiopods are. Um, they are noted for um, basically they have a through gut, meaning they have a mouth, a gut, and then no anus. It's just kind of there. They are not articulated. They are not held together by any kind of hinge. Instead, there are muscles that stream from one shell to the other that hold them together. So naturally then when they die and that soft tissue dissipates or just completely dissolves or is decayed, um, the two separate shells kind of go their separate way. These are unique among brachiopods because their skeletons are made of a calcium phosphatic um, mineral very close to the same thing that our bones are made of and all other brachiopods don't have this so the linguliformia and the craniaformia have a calc phosphate skeleton they're dominant in clastic sediments so sandstones muds etc and today we find them in beaches and in the deep marine uh, but in the past they were typically everywhere especially in the cambrian and these are usually dinky shells uh, two centimeters and larger would be giants among here these are usually little small things they look like little fingernails basically then they are contrasted with what we used to call the class articulata now these are all grouped into the subphylum rhynchonelliformia uh, again, benthic creatures, epifaunal or some sort of infaunal suspension feeders, immobile, they're both separate sexes and hermaphrodite. You can rattle all this off and read it later, but they are known for their boom and bust distributions throughout the Paleozoic. The last bust basically uh, almost wiping them out at the end of the Permian, and they've had low, low diversity ever after. They are also known for the blind gut. They have no anus. They are hinged together. So this is what they mean by articulated. They're held together by hinges in the two shells. And the skeleton is made of calcium carbonate or calcite. Therefore, they are most preserved and they live preferentially on the warm carbonate shelves of the Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. Today, they tend to live in mostly clastic environments, and what I mean by cryptic, I mean literally underwater caves or the Arctic. Uh, the, the, the metaphor or the image you're supposed to see is that they, they were pushed there in their competitions with bivalves. They are the inferior group, and now they can't live in these once prime real estate areas where they used to be. Generally small, but there are some large ones. If we look at their soft part anatomy, they are known for their lophophore. That's this sort of pinkish thing with the little tentacles on it. Uh, it's their all-purpose um, uh, feeding, breathing, cleaning tool. We'll see that in just a second. Also the pedicle. They have a hole in one of the valves out of which a muscular stalk extends. 
and then this glues them to the, the bottom. And so once this is glued down by a little larval brachiopod, that thing stays there the rest of its life. If you cut it off or if they somehow get separated, they never reattach and they just kind of sit there and keep living, really. Uh, they also have uh, some muscles that kind of stream from one shell to the other that holds them together. Um, and then they have, you know, all kinds of other things. You can identify their digestive system, reproductive system, nervous system, etc. But the lophophore is the big one. Uh, and this is that, that feature here. It has two large tentacles, one for the left side of the shell, one for the right side of the shell. And then they're covered by smaller tentacles, which are then covered by little cilia that will beat in unison and they start sucking in water. They do what we call generating an inhalant current. It comes in on the sides, they grab the food that way, and then they spew it out the front. So water plus food comes in on the sides, cleaned water free of the food spits out the front. That's the exhalant current. This is just a slide showing, you know, detailed pictures of the tentacles and the various cilia doing this. The function, uh, it pumps water for some ordered flow. Uh, this shell can be clogged very easily by all kinds of sediment or other creatures or debris. And it's sort of one way to keep water flowing in and out and keep the shell clean. Uh, every one of the little cilia there will also grab food particles and manipulate them down the tentacles to the mouth. And there's also gas exchange across this uh, surface, so that's how they breathe as well. They are minimalists in both of these things, so they don't need much food and they don't need much oxygen. Presumably this would have been an advantageous uh, thing that natural selection operated on, in Paleozoic times when food and or oxygen were sometimes at least um, and short, short, short supply. For ancient brachiopods, we don't usually see the lophophore. It's a soft tissue, so it's not preserved. But sometimes they built uh, calcitic skeleton masses that uh, supported the lophophore. In particular, here's a nice big spirifer. We'll learn about those later and they built a spiral lophophore support. It looks like a little slinky in here. And that lophophore, that soft thing, would rest on this. The shell would open, and then it would do its business of moving the cilia to get food and oxygen and all the other stuff in here. The pedicle, uh, here it is sticking out of a what's called a lingula. This is one of the uh, inarticulate brachiopods. Looks like a long, wormy thing. It glues itself down, and as I said before, once it's there, it's stuck. And about the only thing it can do is contract and relax, contract and relax, which can move the brachiopod up and down um, in the sediment in which it lives. whoop de doo If you have pure epifaunal brachiopods, they'll also have a pedicle attachment. And they can also do this up and down motion, like a pogo stick effect. Um, but then they're just kind of going up into the water, then bouncing back off the surface, back and forth. The musculature, now this is interesting. They have two types. They have adductors, and then they have diductors. And adductors, when they contract, they pull the shell closed. They also have didactors, which when they pull, they open the shell up. So look at this. Brachiopods have to do work, work that requires energy, to both open and close their shells. This is a very distinct disadvantage that they have versus bivalves or clams, regular clams. Regular clams have a thing called a ligament between their two shells that um, will always act to open. It's sort of springy and always tensed, and uh, it 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 opens the shell. And that's why when clams die, they no longer have control of this thing and it just opens up um, the shells that way. So again, in the competition between these two bivalved groups, clams versus brachiopods, brachiopods 
definitely are the inferior group here. Uh, usually they have, they're known for their two unequal sized valves or shells. So there's two different views here. You're looking at this one straight on and here's side view. Uh, notice one valve is dark gray, one is a lighter gray. And see they are different sizes. Uh, this one has this prominent hole in it. This is called the foramen and that's where the pedicle would stream out. So that's sometimes called the pedicle valve. It is also known as the ventral valve. Then there is the brachial valve, which is the other one, which is sometimes called the dorsal valve. And so they're labeled here on this diagram for you. When you look at this, this is an interesting way to consider brachiopods uh, versus clams. They're symmetry. They're symmetric uh, plane. So clams, the right valve is a mirror image of the left valve. If you have one in your hand, it's going to be the mirror image of the other, and that's where they hinge together. Brachiopods, the plane of symmetry isn't between the two shells. It kind of slices through both of the shells in the midpoint. So the plane of symmetry is 90 degrees away from the plane of symmetry of the clams. And that's something that's very distinctive. One of the first ways you can tell whether you have a clam versus a brachiopod. You got to talk about their body outlines. You have a whole range of things. You have biconvex shells where you have both of these are inflated outwards to create a living space for the brachiopod inside. You have plano convex shells where there's a one convex one. The, the convex ones are always shown in lavender um, on this area. And then the other one is plano or planar or flat. So a flat shell uh, a hinge to um, a very convex shell or you have two valves that are sort of spooned together. You have a concavo convex uh, body outline. You have to describe that when you're looking at your bracket pods. The pedicle openings themselves can have a whole bunch of different shapes. Uh, if it's a perfectly round shape, we call it a foramen. If it is triangular, we call it a deltherium. And then on the other little valve, so the brachial valve, which normally doesn't have a pedicle opening, it will have a little triangular opening on its side, and we call that a nototherium. Uh, a lot of little words that uh, we use to describe these things. Sometimes brachiopods, um, as they got older and bigger, they no longer needed to attach themselves. The pedicle atrophies away, and then mineral deposits fill this up, and the brachiopod just sat there on the substrate without being permanently attached. Of course, it still wouldn't move away. A big thing now, ornamentation. Uh, these are all the little lines or linear structures you see on the shell. So first of all, we talk about concentric shell, concentric ornament. This is the ornament that you see kind of sort of encircling the shell this way, and this represents its growth. So this line right here represents when that was a little juvenile brachiopod. Here's where it's a midlife brachiopod, and there right at the edge is where it is today. And then that's contrasted with radial uh, ornament, which is ornament that radiates from the beaks, the, the pointed area at the top, the all the way down here. Uh, again, more better, closer pictures, a radial ornament. You can see all of these are sort of lines that represent sort of ups and downs, corrugations of the shells of the brachiopods, and they, they radiate out from the beak area. And this is a shell strengthening feature. As I said in class, there are lots and lots of terms for this. Just look at this. Uh, diagram right here. Costa, second order, third order, costella, there's costelli, you can say it's ramicostellate, parvicostellate, fascicocostellate, go on and on and on. We love terms. I just want you to recognize whether radial ornament is present or not present. One of the ways you can describe it though is you can take your little calipers and put them actually on the shell and say, oh, for a one millimeter measure I have, and then count the costelli. 
or costi, the radial ornament. Another picture, just to show you an actual photograph of one of these things. This is a very biconvex rinconellid shell. And you can see, even though there's this shell isn't perfectly preserved, you can see the radial ornament all over the place. Now, what is hinging? What is articulating these two shells together? They have what they call hinge, teeth, and sockets. So on one shell, there will be teeth. There'll be these little sort of um, bump-like projections sticking out. And then the other valve has sockets where those little teeth would stick into them. And so that's where it sort of hinges together. Teeth into socket from the pedicle valve into the brachial valve. These hinge teeth can have a huge amount of variation. You see a whole bunch of pictures here. And again, if I were describing these things for a publication, I'd have to agonize over all of these different types of things and describe them in great, great detail. You don't have to. You just need to recognize that brachiopods indeed have hinge teeth and hinge sockets. The hinging type can either be described as astrophic or strophic. So astrophic, the hinge between the two valves is at a point at the top of the shell. And this is usually two, very te two teeth really, really closely spaced. So right where I'm moving the cursor on each of these things here, that would be where the hinge is holding these two shells together. That is contrasted with a strophic shell type where you basically have many 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 teeth so along a linear feature so you're looking at a side view of a brachiopod and here's a top view with two different valves and the red line marks where the one valve is hinged with the other one and so instead of having two little teeth right at the beak or point area of the shell they can be hundreds of little teeny tiny teeth but usually you know 10, 20, 30 or so um, little teeth meeting little sockets. So a strophic shell is what we call alate. It's very wide. And an astrophic shell comes to a, round, a point or a rounded um, pointy area here. So you need to know the difference between strophic and astrophic. Uh, just some pictures of various strophic hinging. Uh, here's uh, the lower picture is a spirifrid brachiopod. You can see the strong radial ornament on this thing. Um, the hinge would be this big, broad, flat area. Here's what we call a conated brachiopod. And this, this linear feature right here is where the hinging would be on this. Notice as well for both of these, you can see the prominent uh, concentric ornament. There's a few lines of concentric ornament. Again, representing the different growth stages of the shell and then lots of strong um, radial ornament. Uh, there is what we call a fold and sulcus, which is sometimes preserved. So instead of having uh, valves where they meet in sort of a straight line across, a lot of times there will be a huge uh, fold in the shell that is then met by a sulcus, which is the opposite side. So go back one to this slide. Notice here, you've got the, the, the edge of the shell going this way, this way, and then there's this huge drop here. This would be the fold and sulcus of this shell. It looks like a mega, mega uh, radial ornament. So it looks like you've got all these little tiny radial ornaments and then one big, big, big one. Uh, that's the fold and sulcus. And again, just some pictures of this. A fold is the upward deflection, and then the sulcus is what meets it. You probably have a little bit of difficulty recognizing fold and sulcus, and I recognize that. Then we have the inter areas. So in the flat part of the strophic shells, mostly, uh, you can first you first recognize your uh, pedicle openings, your deltherium, your nototherium, and then this big flat area beside the pedicle openings. This is what we call the inter areas, and again they are described and measured and and everything else by us brachiopod workers. 
spines. Uh, spines are characteristic of productants, where they have them all over all of the valves, as you can see in this cute little creature right here, or on conetids, where they only have them on their hinge line only. F spines probably had a whole range of various uh, functions. Uh, defense, so not that they would swing them around or anything, but if you're covered with a bunch of spines, then critters that are going around looking for things to bite and eat will avoid or test the spines, say forget it and go find something else to eat. They probably also use them to anchor themselves in the substrate. Most of these things lived um, either halfway or almost all the way buried in the sediment with just a little bit poking out. And these would act like roots to sort of anchor or root them in there. They are hollow, and so they would they act, they were hollow with um, connection from the outside to the inside. So the thought was that maybe they had some sensory or nervous function sensing the environment. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, I mentioned that conetids have spines elsewhere. So instead of having them all over the body, if you have things that only have spines on the top of the um, area near the hinge line. These are conetids, a different group, which we'll talk about later. Again, most of the spines tend to break off, but here you can still see the little bumps on the top of this. They would have had, you know, extensions out this way, but you can still tell that it's a conetid. And then finally, a good tactic, something that you should do, something that you will do for the first lab, uh, on the, yeah, the second lab on brachiopods, is to describe the three brachiopods that you have in your um, little bag of brachiopods that was distributed in class. And so one of them looks sort of like this. Um, and I'll give you a hint. You really have to describe the ornament here and things like that. But then you should also have two other brachiopods in your bag and one should look something like this. Notice the hinge line I'm pointing out and one should look something like this. And then using all of these other features that I've pointed out in this uh, particular note set, describing the morphology of brachiopods, you should do this. Um, these are morphologic terms. This describes the morphology of the original brachiopod shell. Now, brachiopods, as we're going to see in um, not the next lecture set, but the one after that. Their shells can then be modified by taphonomic processes. So we're going to circle back from taphonomy, which we talked about week one, and zero back on these brachiopods and talk about how taphonomy then is going to modify these shells. So there's a big, beautiful, pristine museum specimen but are you going to always find this? No, you're not. You're going to find things altered by taphonomy, which we also describe.